Hi, my name is David Lauer, and you are watching Club Fantasy, and today we have with us Jason Washburn from Talent Strike Studios, and we are talking about Hooch the Card Game, currently on Kickstarter, and I have to say personally, I love the game. It's an exciting game, uh, and from my own point of view, it's not like any card game you've ever played before. This is more like a board game that just happens to incorporate cards. So uh, throw any preconceived notions you have about card games out the window when you start thinking about Hooch. Jason, welcome to the welcome to the uh, program, so to speak. Hi, right, thank you, thank you, David. Appreciate that. All right. Oops, I just dropped your cards all over the place. Um, now, a while back, I had done a little quick blog about Hooch uh, and the marketing of it and how you sent it to me. And before we get too too uh, far into this interview, I just want to kind of show some of the people, you know, what what you had done and why to me I was so impressed because you don't get a whole lot of this as a board game reviewer. And um, now everybody can't see everything you sent me because some of the packaging is gone now. But uh, if they check out the uh, the, the blog, um, Elicit and Marketing, I think it was called Elicit and Marketing from Pooch, uh, they'll see some of the photos. But they can see here that uh, let me let me make my screen a little bigger for a second here. You can see here that there is a a ton of custom made art books. Um, that made for this game, you know, uh, pamphlets that held all the additional bonuses, um, and it was all custom made for Club Fantasy, and um, it was just amazingly done. And I, you know, I, people should understand what they're getting if they back this game, right? Yeah. Right, especially if they back uh, at the higher levels. This was one of the most impressive prototypes that have ever been sent to me. And it was all hand done, handmade, and a lot of it was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, done in the way that it would have been done back in the 1920s. Uh, that, that was the style you used, correct? Yeah, very definitely. There was uh, no tape used on any of the packaging. You know, you usually wrap a package now, you just use scotch tape, but I didn't do that. Um, it's all was done uh, with glue, just like it would have been done in the, in the early 20s, um, 1919. Uh, when the uh, prohibition was uh, start to come about for the United States, so I wanted it to be as authentic as possible, um, and the whole purpose for that was so that when it comes across who's ever desk that it got sent to, is that they said, "Oh, wait a minute, this is not um, my average uh, thing here," um, and that's kind of been my process the whole way through, and um, that's what my process is and the other professional things that I'm involved in. So why should my game be any different than when I build professional props for theater or whatever have you. So uh, taking a page out of that book for me and, and that's why it is uh, what it is uh, that you you have in front of you when you see that. Right, and, and for the people who uh, don't know, I mean, these are the things he sent me. All the cards were in their own individual cases and you can see you know, the artwork is amazing. I didn't pull the cards out. I just left them in the cases. Um, all the stuff is very well done. And one of the things for me being a marketer for a living is presentation and how professional the company is that's sending me stuff. And the more pro professional they are when they send me even their prototypes, the more likely I am to back or talk about their product because I know that the end result is probably going to be very, very well done versus some of the prototypes I get sent, which are just a bunch of pieces and an envelope mailer that aren't even plastic baggies. So it's a big, huge, giant mess. And so I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time to do this. Well, you're welcome. It, you know, for me, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, to I mean, it's work, but it's also fun to take, to take that. I mean, you spend two and a half years designing a game, working on it, refining it, getting it to a point where it plays well and you really have the feel of what you're trying to bring across, and uh, I'll get into that with you a little bit here, but the, that's the idea, and it, for me, it really has to start with that, and, and um, that's what I wanted to convey. So when you open that package up, and it should be that. It should be, oh my gosh, what, you know, and, and that's what I wanted, and um, I know, I believe that I achieved that. I've got a lot of feedback on the prototypes that went out and the people that received them and that uh, it was, you know, they thought it was, uh, I got 
things like this is crazy cool. Oh my gosh, how much work is the, you know how many hours did that take you? What have you put into it? And um, so it's a lot of good comments that way, and that makes me feel good about the time and energy that I spent doing it. But it's a lot of fun for me because I themed everybody's a little bit different. Um, you know, you got some different promos than than the next guy got. Uh, so you know. Um, like for instance, Rhian Oaks, I sent her a copy. She, I sent a necklace with a with a H with little pink studs on it, so it's all female looking, um, you know. So it's, it fits that uh, League of Nonsensical Gamers. I sent them one. I sent him cufflinks, um, so I made custom hooch cufflinks for him. Uh, I know that when he got that, he was that he was uh, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I sent. Uh, Dice Hate Me got a pair of custom cufflinks, you know, with their monicum with hooch on it. Um, so I kind of did different things for everybody uh, that um, a as I kind of went through it, um, just trying to come up with the different with the different things. Um, you know, uh, Board Game Duel uh, has a great review on the game, and she and her group really enjoyed it. But it was funny because before I sent it to her, we were talking about hooch and the prohibition, and she made some comment about drinking hooch while playing hooch and uh, so I made a custom mason jar with some <laughs> custom art on it for her and right. put that in the box and sent it and uh, she tweeted a picture of it, it was great, she had uh, some stout beer in it while she was playing and it has a little custom thing that hangs down and um, I also sent out, uh, if you can find it, I don't know if you have it in there, I sent out custom thank you cards so I made a logo just for Club Fantasy or Fantasy rather and uh, so on one side of my art was that to thank you, and then on the back side, everybody got a custom back. Right. Um, and yours was the bowler, if I remember correctly. So people watching right now, you can see this little thing right here. It says Team Fantasy Syndicate, the club, which is as some people know that's one of our marketing arms of Club Fantasy for a bunch of us and other reviewers. A little story about our syndicate on the inside. Yeah. You know, and then on the back, there's another thing. So it was completely custom made uh, and very well appreciated. And, um, you know, if more people did this, they'd get a lot more press. And I'm not saying that you should do that for press, but when you weigh the cost of what press originally costs or usually costs somebody to put out a product, um, this is very small in comparison. It usually costs somebody thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to launch a PR campaign. But when you've got a built-in campaign of reviewers who do this most stuff mostly for free, you know, and if you're trying to, you know, really increase your, I should uh, increase my screen, if you're really trying to increase your, your, your mileage out of that, then you want to do some, you know, things that are going to enhance any likelihood of you getting more coverage. So, yeah, that's the play mat there you were holding up. That's, I, I went ahead and ordered neoprene for all the reviewers. Which, again, nobody has ever done. So, you know, that was a big, big deal. And I've, you know, I've gotten, God, this, this year alone, I can't even tell you how many prototypes have been sent to me. And um, I, I've had maybe four that are really worth talking about. And this is probably the most worth talking about. So, um, Thank again, thanks. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the game because, as I said earlier at the beginning of this interview, this is a card game, but it plays like a board game, right? So for those people who are thinking this is, you know, uh, another, uh, it's not like an LCG and it's not nothing like that. There, you have decks of cards, but you don't have uh, deck building mechanics so much in this as you have a set deck. You can you can you can purchase storefronts, um, and you can purchase other cards. That go on, you know, that go on your 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 play mat or your your public, right? Yeah. Yes. You got your yeah. rural area, and you got whatever. So you've got some politicians and things that you can kind of buy off, and then you got your you got your street thugs that you can kind of buy at the bottom there. Right. Uh, um, but other sure. than that, you're not you're not really building a deck, so to speak. So no. How did that come about? Well, I, um, I, I didn't want to, uh, when we first got into this, um, uh, Kyle Olson uh, and myself um, 
kind of came up with the idea of let's let's make this prohibition game. Let's do this. So we did research for about two months about uh, the prohibition, kind of figured out how it all works and how did that work back then. Well, there was a lot of mafia esque type stuff, but there was also a lot of groups that just would make illegal moonshine, and they weren't really mafia people, but they became a gang or a syndicate um, because they had a common goal, let's make money. So um, taking that, it has that mafia feel, it has that noir, but really just how can we build that So and, and get that in there. So you have a set syndicate that you play with. Inside that syndicate, there are 22 cards that every deck is going to have the same, although you're going to score points differently with each deck um, based on what your focus is or what your syndicate's power is, so to speak. So syndicate has like a different flavor to it? Correct, it sure does. You And for instance, the Blind Tigers, which you were holding up some purple cards earlier, those are the Blind Tigers. Uh, they... Um, Oh, and I don't have something to look at right quick, but they come out of a specific part of Temperance Town. This is where this all takes place. And um, so the Blind Tigers are an attack-based uh, syndicate. So they have, they have 22 base cards, and then every syndicate has seven cards that are unique, 100% unique to that syndicate. And for instance, uh, there's a card in the Blind Tigers called Press for Victory. So you have a card, and everybody has a card that's called Framed. So when I come and attack your storefront, you if you have that available, you play the card Framed, and it makes me have to go to a different sin, to a different storefront. I can't attack that storefront. So if you're the Blind Tigers and somebody plays Framed on you, you play Press for Victory right on top of that, and you can go right through their, their Framed card and still attack them because it's an attack-based syndicate. So everything that they have, goes towards that. Whereas like the Big Sixers, which is the red deck, they are defensive based. So now all their cards give you bonuses and defenses and to protect yourself and your storefronts better. Um, the uh, two other decks that come in the base game, uh, the Kickstarts, which is an homage to Kickstarter itself. Uh, there's the Big Sixers right there. Um, so the Kickstarts are commercial based, which means that they uh, get everything they can out of all the commercial spaces that they use, so the storefront, so to speak. And then um, you have, uh, I'm gonna, no, there's the kickstarts right there, definitely. And they got the, you know, we got the, the K, and and they they're green, just like Kickstarter green. So they're they're really cool. There you go. And they have cards that they're, they're flavor cards. So, like, that's one of their cards right there, Bargain Shopper. That's one of their seven cards that allows them to do special things with commercial properties. Um, and that's their, their push. And the Embalmers is the fourth one. They're the brown deck. And uh, they have the production. So they produce a little bit more hooch than other. Uh, there you go. Their thing is the coffin because they, in the storyline, they operate out of the funeral home. So that's what their storefront is, the funeral home. So then all their cards, like, uh, they, they have cards that help them pr to produce more watered down. There's a card you play that gives you more hooch in, in your collection. and So everybody has a different thing. Now, the base game comes with four syndicates, but there are a ton more syndicates out there um, that you're available to add. And now, with each syndicate having a different flavor, a different... Uh, you know, focus is what I call it, a syndicate focus, then um, this allows for a lot of replayability and a lot of differences between them and how that you utilize the other cards within your deck is different for each syndicate. So I might have 22 cards that you have, but when I play the card uh, Coffin Varnish and I'm the Embalmers, I get points off it, where if you play that card as the Blind Tigers, you don't, because it doesn't deal with production, um, but mine does. So there are some points, there are some things like that. Also, on top of that, you have uh, six influence cards in that deck, and you have uh, five event cards. Now, those are in each deck, and that equals 11 cards, but they're all different across all the decks, and there's an event card right there. 
So now they have all the same art on them per, across the decks, but you will notice that the, there's an influence card there that nothing personal. Ah, that's my homage to uh, to another game about gangsters. But um, the they all have the icon and they represent different different things. So the idea being there's 11 of those. Now at the beginning of the game and setup, you're going to take your five event cards and your six influence cards out of your deck, combine them in the center of the table with everybody else's event and influence cards, and then you're going to shuffle those and then deal them out like poker. So every time I sit down to play, I'm getting six different influence cards, I'm getting five different event cards, I have seven cards that are unlike anybody else because they're my syndicate. So then that's going to equal 18 cards. So every time I play the game, I have 18 cards that are not. So half my deck is just tailored to me. It doesn't, you know, so it it's not a deck builder, but it has a, a mechanic in the game that is representative of deck building, where you're not just going to have the same old deck every time, and the other thing is, it's not something that you build that uh, is like, oh, well, that guy's going to win because he went and bought the best cards at the store, and, you know, so it's not a pay-to-win game either. Um, the next cool thing is, every syndicate comes with two storefronts, and uh, in the storyline, they are representative of that, and to give you an example, the Vice Squad, which is the Dirty Cops, they have the donut shop. That's the tailor shop right there. That's the embalmers. They have the tailor shop and they have the uh, funeral home. So each storefront also has a unique ability to it. So um, the the great thing about it, I believe, the home is you allows you to keep an extra or draw an extra card or keep a card. I think it's draw yeah. an extra. Funeral home, is draw, uh, funeral home is draw an extra card in your draw phase. Right. So now if you have that on, if you own that and you're controlling that, when you draw, instead of drawing five, you're going to draw six cards. So it's unique to the person that owns it. Now let's say I'm sitting across from you and you have that storefront, but I really want the ability of that sixth card. So then what, what do I do? I'm going to come over and attack you and try and take that away from you, and then I get that ability when it comes over to me. So the storefront abilities float to the player that controls that storefront, just like it would in real life. If you control that facility, you should get the benefits that that facility has. So that's the idea. So that's the deck um, itself that you play with. And the storefronts are available to anybody um, in the game. Everybody's so. storefronts get mixed up at the beginning of the game. Correct. And they're, you have nothing to start with. They're out there. They're purchasable. Uh, in order to make that purchase, you have to have a mouthpiece, which is a lawyer. Um, the mouthpiece is a nickname that uh, gangsters used to have for what a lawyer is because he speaks for you. There you go. There's a mouthpiece card right there. So um, the mouthpiece, his unique ability is to buy and open a storefront. So once I have a mouthpiece on my payroll working for me, then I can go and buy commercial property open up a business and it has a legitimate business in the front and they did back then and then in the back I make an alcohol that I'm selling so each storefront creates a set number of hooch during that round you can increase that with cards and stills so and just because the number on there isn't the number it's always going to be you can purchase stills and up that uh, production and you can also um, put cards uh, down when you're playing in your purchase base to up that production as well so um, it's really it's a very fluid game and there's a lot of cool things that come into play and in how your deck makes those connections with uh, the mechanics and the things that are there so it's really a very dynamic environment but it's also a replay because sitting right now we have 11 syndicates. Um, I got a backer that backed to 2,500, which means that he's paid for a syndicate to go game wide. That's what he paid for $2,500. So he and I will design a syndicate together that fits within the monicum of the game. He'll get to name it as long as it's you know not a goofy name, but he'll get to do that and and everything else. And and now as a backer. How cool is that? You get the four syndicates that come with the base game, plus you get the lethal 
ladies exchange did that update yesterday that's just free and that's a whole thing of in itself and then you're going to get this this backer who's so awesome to back it at $2500 now you're going to get his syndicate so you're getting six syndicates so um, in the, in the in the base game so it's it's really awesome from that standpoint and then you can begin to see okay if I'm if I have a game group and I'm playing this typically four people we play with all the time I got six syndicates to choose from well each one of us might want to play each different syndicate well how many different games is, are we gonna get in doing that well it's a lot that's a lot of replay value plus two there's there's add-ons and there's other syndicates out there and there's some other things that stretch goals we want to get to and that are gonna incorporate new syndicates and different stuff but um, something that's interesting and this is funny uh, um, I sent the game to Lance to have him look at it the undead Viking and I'll just real quick briefly he talked about that in, in uh, his review of it that the rules are right here the rules are always the same but you bring that different syndicate in and uh, uh, apply it to those rules and you get a different flavor and a different feeling when you play that and if I bring in this other syndicate I'm gonna play this one and they all have different cards and different abilities so it, it's kinda cool and I, I appreciate that he said that because that was one of our goals as designers is to give that um, replay value to the game. Like, you know, you still want to play the same game over and over and over again. And I don't want a game where you got to go down and spend a ton of money to buy up new cards and different things. And so um, that's the other side of things is that just within the box itself, you're going to get a lot of a lot of that, a lot of flavor, a lot of replay ability. Well, now let's talk a little bit about some some more of the basics of the game. But, you know, sure. we've, got, we've got two different cards here. You've got syndicate characters. Yes. Right? And then yes. you've got public characters. Right? Correct. So, now, yes. And I've got the politician there. So uh -huh. here is like your dirty rats, man. These are the people that you've hired to do all the, all the, all the dirty work, right? Correct. And, They're, right. And then the public characters are, are the, the other side of things. They're your, your public figures. And they're, if you notice, they all come from public authoritative jobs. So... Right. For instance, the politician, he works for the city hall, he works for whatever. You bring him on the payroll, and now you can utilize his, you can start twisting him, and you can utilize his ability to starve off city politics. Um, if he, he has the ability to become the mayor, and then that makes you immune to certain things within the game because you're the mayor. Um, so the public, the public uh, group, there's five of them, and they all allow you to do different things. Uh, but you can get they are all Play at one time. Usually, you have to you have to purchase these cards. Correct. They, yes, you have to bring them onto your payroll, just like you would in real life. You're running a criminal syndicate. You're gonna have to go out, find them, pay them, and bring them back and put them to work. And now they work for you. So then, underneath that, you have your syndicate. Now, those are people that are gonna just be folks that um, are within your syndicate. And you say, hey, this guy's a hitman, or this guy's a snitch, or this guy's a grifter. Um, so it kind of works that way. And when we did the research, and there you go, there's a capo. When when we did the research on this, we wanted to get it true to life to have that feeling, and that's how it works. They would put public people on their things and syndicates. So you take your syndicate characters, and you get them at a low level. So for instance, you pay a rat to come on your payroll and then he does what a rat does he goes out and gets information and allows you to retain that information um, and then you can run missions with these guys take them out on missions and your syndicate characters can get promoted to be more powerful which is what happens in in uh, criminal entities you know guys go out and they do things and they make a name for themselves and then what happens the boss gives them more responsibility more power more you can do more things so we wanted to capture that in a game mechanic so you go out and run your mission you come back and he's more powerful so a rat goes out and he comes back he becomes a snitch and now he has more people uh, that he can talk to and more things he can do so he has a lot more power so though that's the basis for how the things work and the other, and the other thing is, is that none of the stuff is safe, right? These people can be attacked and killed, and you have to lose them and, and bring and find a new snitch, so to speak, or a new politician, or the next Correct. mayor. And right. Well, and and that's very much so. You know, um, you think about uh, the ruthlessness of Al Capone because he was a big, you know, figure in this time. Um, so think about that. You think that Al Capone is going to sit back and let some other gang or syndicate have? 
you know, guys up in City Hall that he couldn't control? Uh-uh. So what's he going to do? He's going to neutralize them. He's going to whack them out. He's going to take them for a ride. He's going to do all these things. Well, you get to do that. It's really cool. So if you see another syndicate across the way from you and they're starting to get some power, then you just send some dudes over and you try and take out his mouthpiece or you take out the politician or their capo or their madam or whatever. Um, now, to circumvent that as a player, you can put guys on protection. So um, a card you haven't shown yet are the crew cards, and they're the, the hoods. And these are your... You got hoods and you got muscle and you got wise guys and you got a boss. And these are your dudes. These are your crews. So the, the way it works is you're a syndicate leader. You hire specific people to do specific jobs. And then you have your low level guys. There you go. There's a hood. So that's the cheapest guy in your syndicate. He's a, a cost one hooch there. And he does one point of damage. And then that goes up as you get a muscle. It's a little bigger guy, and that's a wise guy. So he's a cost three, and he's a damage three, you know. And then you can upgrade that to a boss, which is a cost of four and a damage four. Um, so these are the dudes that go out and do things and make things happen. They're the the blood, sweat, and tears of the of your syndicate, so to speak. So if there you go, there's the muscle. So if you want to if you want to knock over somebody else's storefront or you want to go make a hit on a guy, you take crew with you, just like you would in in real life. You're not going to go and do that by yourself unless you you know you hire a specific hitman to do that. And there's the ability to do that in the game. We have cards like that. But um, you you know you want to go and attack a storefront. You take two or three crew members with you. All their combat value adds together to make them stronger as a crew, as a team. And then you go against that storefront. And then you hope that uh, your rival doesn't have uh, a whole lot of protection sitting on that storefront. And you won't know. There's a fog of war in this game where you don't know what that guy has sitting in that storefront because his cards are turned upside down. You know it's protected, but you don't know what the value of those cards are. Um, you can guess there's there's you know educated guessing that would go on and you would know that too how big somebody else's syndicate is or how powerful they may be but um, you know that's the cool thing about this game is you don't you don't know that for sure so when you go and flip the cards he may only have two cards but one of them might be a boss well now that's four points and then he might have a wise guy that's a total of seven points of defense right. and if you're bringing a couple of muscle you're sitting at four, he's sitting at seven, and and uh, so now you're at a disadvantage, but you didn't know that. So there's some of that that goes on. Now, there are ways to find out that information. And we don't need to get too much into that, but th there are some things in the game that you have mechanics that allow you to go out and find what uh, those guys may or may not have and, and some things like that. So there's, there's just a – the theme – and, and the whole thing from that time frame and what it is to have a syndicate and gang warfare, it's all in there. There you go. Now that's that's from an expansion, the Lethal Ladies expansion, which you get for free when you back the game. Um, they have different cards. So that was the Harpy, that's the Amazon. You're going to get the Hellcat. There you go. And then the last one is the uh, Tigress, and she's the level four. So... The cool thing about the Lethal Ladies is they only hire women. It's an all-female syndicate. Um, and uh, when you get that expansion, you're going to get those cards. You're going to get crew that are all female. The crew you were showing earlier, just the generic crew that every syndicate would hire, just the guys that they would hire, that is unique just to it. Now that you're showing a, a blind tiger uh, hood, and I put promo cards that I had made, um, that's a stretch goal to get to. So every syndicate would have their own crew, colored crew. And uh, the promos are just to give you guys the idea of what it looks like in the red, in the, in the different colors. That There you go. There's the Kickstarter color behind them. So um, as a reviewer, and, and uh, hopefully uh, get those out there, that uh, this is something we want to do. So that's a stretch goal. And that's a promo card is still... Um, that's from an old build of the game. We use uh, counters now, but I thought I'd throw some of those in there. I thought they were cool. Um, uh, so we wanted to give some extra gifts to those 
folks that spend so much time helping us um, to get information out there about the game and play it, you know. Right. You deserve that. Well, we appreciate it, that's for sure. So well, thanks. The, the last thing I want to talk about game, as far as the functionality of the game goes is this, and this is what sets up every round, and this is what allows those uh, uh, syndicate players or cards to really come into play, and that is your... The action cards. Yeah. yeah, so at the beginning of your turn, there's there, it's there's eight phases in your turn, and you think that sounds like a lot, but it, it's really not. The uh, action phase is the first phase, and, and that's the old switcheroo you're seeing right now. Right there, but icons on the card represent some different things for you. And if you look there, you got a mission, and then you got the action down below it. So basically, as a player, um, the first thing you do is discard down to five cards, and then you draw your action card. You're going to flip that over. Um, the hooch crate up in the corner allows you to draw one extra hooch, and then you read the action. If there's a public mission available, you can do it. And then you read the bottom of the card, and then it uh, has an action. And sometimes it's co-op, and sometimes it's player-based. Um, many of the cards are co-op-based, though. So there's there are co-op parts of this game as well. Um, and this this right here uh, kind of pushes that along. It also certify. It also works rather as a uh, um, timer for the game. So when the action deck runs out, that's one way for the end game to trigger. Um, there are three ways to, to trigger the end game in, in our design, um, but that is one of them. Um, the action deck runs out. So every player flips an action card at the beginning of his turn. Um, if you're playing a four-player game, there's 45 action cards. Uh, we're still there. One or two tweaks there, it, uh, you know, possibly... Uh, having a little bit less cards when you play with less people, so the game, you know, it, around about 10 rounds is, is, is plenty. Um, and that's what 45 gives you. Um, so that's kind of what you want. Um, and, and then, you know, you move through the different phases a, as you go. So you complete the action, then you do the purchase phase, you buy your guys. Uh, yes, there's the, I'm sorry it was black and white. I wanted it to be color. Still looks color. Still very it was so expensive to get <laughs> color printing. Um, still, still cool, and and you know, just so that people can see it, it's you know, it, it's a little bit unique, it's a little bit innovative, and it's very well done. Yeah, it's and I, that's all me. I did all the I did the layout on that and all the artwork on that. I'm the artist for the game as well. Um, so, and there's one or two things we're still, you know, I'm sure that we'll tweak in there before. Uh, it prints, but I would say 99% of what you played and what you have um, is what it is. Uh, and there may be some things like that. We've also talked about um, doing a couple of things, changing up for, uh, you know, a lot of games come out and have like advanced rules and less, you know, for people that kind of want to get a little more in depth and do a little bit more things with it. So um, we're kind of shooting that around a little bit. So it doesn't change the mechanics of the game at all. It just, um, Gives you a little bit more uh, added to it for those folks that might want that a little bit more theme in their in their game. Um, so uh, that's kind of some of the stuff we're throwing around. But the game is as you played it, David, is is what it is. Right. And for those people watching, um, it's really thematic. It's a really fun game. Um, you, you know, you got so much going on, and it, even uh, the first time I played it, I had to play two characters, and the other person played one character. Um, oh, you you uh, it? <laughs> I had to, oh. uh, but, uh, but it was still a lot of fun, and, and you know, um, I was very much just so because I was still trying to learn the rules. I wasn't really thinking about you know what the next guy I was going to play was going to do. So I played this stuff, and then there was next guy's turn, and then I ended up screwing myself because the next guy had the cards that immediately, you know, kind of uh, uh, took away all the actions I just taken or whatever. So it was a lot of fun, and I didn't really, I still didn't really know what was coming. So it was like playing against a different player. Um, but, um, you know, it's a great game. I was really shocked at how much fun I had playing this game, how thematic it is. There's definitely a lot of replayability. There's a lot of things going on. The, you know, the different flavors with the doing the action card and then doing the missions and then, then purchasing your cards and then uh, playing any cards that you're going to play against your opponents and making your attacks and those kinds of things. Um, there's a lot to this game. You know, and it's, you know, well worth... 
the Kickstarter price. So if you're watching this, this game is something you should definitely get behind because I know we've all bought uh, backed a lot of Kickstarters where the game looks really good or whatever, but you get it and it's just another game. It's not bad, but it's not great. This is a good game. This is a really good game, and this is something that deserves a lot more attention than what it's getting. So uh, if you trust my judgment at all, back the game, plain and simple. Well, I, I appreciate that. One of the one of the interesting things is when you when you look at it, and um, seems like there's you know there's so much to do as a syndicate leader, right? right. But uh, we we also kind of hone that down a little bit, and there's order. You're going to have to order your guys to do different things, and so that's how we, the control within that. You get three orders to start with. You can up that to four when you get a sixth payroll character because your syndicate's growing. But in order to make an attack, you got to drop an order to use an ability. You got to drop an order to use a talent. You got to drop an order to go on a mission. You got to drop an order. So um, you know, uh, I guess way way back when, a year and a half ago, when we kind of were in this phase, and then somebody would take a turn, and you're like. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? <laughs> it was kind of so we we and we then got to the well. We need to come up with a mechanic that's going to do that, and then uh, that the order mechanic developed, and we started to bring that into play, and and now it just it just flows, and and it's really cool. It's great to to have that because that's what you would do as a syndicate leader. You would order your guys to go and do stuff. So I, as a designer, I wanted to do that as as best I could to give you the feeling of what it is to run. A criminal kit in the CD underworld of the prohibition, um, and I really wanted you to feel feel that. And I, you know, before I was ever a game designer, I was a game player, um, probably like most. And um, if I ever do a game, you still tell yourself, or I could do better than this, or I could come up with something that might be just as good as this, or you know, you have those things that float around in your head. But I thought to myself. When, they, when somebody plays this game, I want an experience. And that's, to me, that's what you want to give somebody. When you play D&D, &D, that's the experience you're, you're, you're getting. You know, What is it to be that guy facing that monster in a dungeon doing that? Well, how can I do that in the Prohibition? Well, i got to give you all these different choices, and I have all these different things coming at you, and everybody that wants a piece of you. And, and that's really what that world was. You, know? you had a lot of things you had to watch. You had a lot of things you had to do. So we wanted to do that, but we also wanted to make it controllable. We wanted to make it playable. We wanted to make it, um, you know, fun. And how can you do that? By, by having those orders and having those things and then allowing you to do things. So throughout well, the gameplay, you earn respect points, which is how you win. Right. And, and the other thing I liked about it was because at the beginning of every turn, you have to discard down to five cards. You have right. to choose you about the cards you're going to pick. And in a way, you are kind of role-playing the head of this syndicate and the style of that deck. So I found that really, really interesting because your event cards allow you to do certain things that you can play. Your influence cards allow you to do certain things that you can play. Um, you know, then you've got all the, the special powers of your crew and, and all that kind of stuff. And it, it, it very much feels like you're organizing something to make something happen. Right? You're, you're yeah. telling this politician to do this and stop them from doing that. You're sending this crew over here to attack that storefront or that character. You're, um, you know, you're playing cards that allow you to steal somebody's hooch and give it to another player. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And, and um, it really was a lot of fun. And I was really shocked because, you know, I got the game and I'm like, oh, this is so cool looking. It, but when you put it down on the table and you start playing through, you're like, man, this is even better than I imagined. It really is. I mean, I get a lot of games, and sometimes you open an opening, and you play them like, okay, it's another card game. You know, it's fun, it's decent, it's not bad, but this really felt like an experience. And in, in my line of work, we're always selling the experience. So if somebody's going to put some money on a Kickstarter, if somebody's going to back something, I would think, like I think, that you, you want an experience. You don't want just another board game, right? Right, it right. Has not, not only does it have smooth mechanics and things that make it play very well, but it provides a completely thematic experience that when you're done playing that game, you felt like you played a game. Not only did you get the fun and the action of it, but you had a lot of thought that had to go into this game. You know, right? And 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 that's that's it. I, it's not 
it's not a, a super light game. There's there's some thinking that's going to come into play, and then you got to make decisions. And like you said, with the you discard down, um, and that was a really cool thing that came out of going to Gen Con 2013 with the game in the first playtest hall. We took it in there and, and put it through its paces, and had a lot of people filter through and play it over those uh, four days. And that was something that came out of that that uh, you should draw your cards at the end of your turn and discard at the beginning of your turn. Um, kind of different than a lot of card games are, where you do it the opposite. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, first of all, you have your whole off turn to decide what you're going to keep and what you're not, and you're not sitting there at the end of your turn thinking about what you're going to discard and wasting everybody's time. That was one. And two, when you're in your off turn, you still get to play. That's the other cool thing about this game. You can still drop orders like, for example, you can drop an order on your capo to boost your combat stat in your off turn. So if you attack my politician, I can drop an order on my capo and give my politician a plus one to his combat. So that, And then whatever protection he has. So the cool thing is I can do things. When it's not my turn, I still get to play. I still get to be involved. And if I had a full hand when I came to my, my uh, draw phase, I draw three. Now I have eight cards to defend with. So as a defender, you have an advantage over the attacker who only has five cards. So there, there's some strategy that comes into that is, okay, what am I going to discard so that I can do what I need to do next turn? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really uh, a thought process that comes with that. And then your turn, you know, it comes back around to you, and then you've got to go, okay, uh, i got to discard down to my five to start my turn. So well, if I was – go ahead. I was going to say the other thing I like about that is – even though it's not your turn, you have to pay attention because you have to know what these people are buying and put it in their hideout or putting them at their storefronts. Because right. when you're ready to attack, you have to make sure you have enough strength to attack that person. Correct. Correct. So you have to be there, on the game. Yes, definitely you do. This isn't something where it's you, you end your turn and then you pick up your phone and you tweet or you, you text to your buddies. Uh, and I've played a lot of games that, that do that. Um, so you, you definitely do because then when they come and attack you, uh, you're going to have to do things. Not only that, there's other ways to get you involved. There's the, co the you know, they may flip an action card and it's a co-op card. So you're going to have to do stuff. There's uh, co-op cards for hotspots and co-op cards for raids that, from the U.S. Bureau of uh, Treasury Agents and different things like that. That affects everybody. That affects the whole game. So it's right. not your turn, but you're still you're still playing. You're still engaged actively in what is going on. So. That was another thing we tried to do as uh, as game designers is you know if you don't really pay attention and it's when it's not your turn you're going to make a mistake um, you know how bad that mistake is going to be <laughs> you know I've played a lot of this game and I'll tell you sometimes it's worse sometimes it's not but uh, you you definitely do better when you're actively engaged and and um, it's a little bit longer play but it doesn't feel that I know that when we play. Um, we play anywhere from hour and a half to two hours, um, and it, it doesn't feel like, wow, that was, you know, an hour and, and a half or, you know, an hour and 45 minutes, but it only feels like you, you played an hour maybe um, just because the, the flow of the game and the time and the different things you get to do. And um, it's, a, I mean, it's cool, you know, you'll start putting cards down, at, you know, on people, Firebug and Button Man, and, you know, people really get into it, and that, always tells me that the theme really starts to come through for those folks. Um, you know, it, it, and, and that that makes me feel good as a, as a designer, you know, as somebody who's created this thing. And, and when you talk about experience, that is, that's what you get. You feel that. You feel that tension. When you know, you're like, ooh, I just bought a storefront and I only got one guy protecting it right now. Ooh, don't attack me. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're waiting. Right. You know? The, the um, oh, what was I just going to say? I just totally spaced it out. Oh, I want to get on to a little bit of, of some of the, the basics. So it plays three to six players, but it comes with a, a base set of four. Right? Correct. So yes. if you, when you see that, realize you're getting four syndicates, right? You get right. Syndicates, but you can add two more to make it a, a six-player experience. Um, and what now age-wise, you know, this is a little bit of an adult theme, although it doesn't really play alcohol so much. I mean, that's no. just really currency. But there is a title in here called Working Girl, yep. and you know, us adults know what that means. But the effect of the Working Girl doesn't all really come off like a working girl. So if you're an adult, 
I wouldn't worry so much about that card. If you have to explain what a working girl is, you can make something up, but it does not come off as, you know, prostituted. So, um, for my own thing, you know, I feel like if the kid's 12 or older at least, this isn't really an issue. Um, I don't know how some people are about that, but you can explain that card fairly simply without it getting too much more than it needs to be. And um, But for the younger kids, maybe it's not quite as appropriate. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, we have 14, age 14 on the box, so 14 plus should be should be fine. I would tell you that um, uh, when I first started doing this, um, Evan, uh, he's, I mean, I started two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, but he was, I think when he played it, um, you know, he was 12, first time he sat down and played it, and um, he's a very learned child, and um, he was, I mean, he didn't have any problems with it. Uh, so, and, every, and every parent's different, but yeah, 14 plus is what we have on it. Um, I would tell you if you have a more mature uh, kid who's really into games, then sure. Um, and there's some of those things in there, um, but it's cleanly done. It's it's very yeah. tasteful. There's nothing yeah. nothing that, that really is makes it uh, a, a real danger to anything. Your kid is seeing a lot more on TV or yeah. on the internet that they ever will see in this game. I would agree. Yeah, yeah, your your cartoons you're watching are more risque than this is. So, um, so you know, as far as that goes, I would I would put a little less worry into that. Um, now, what else about this game? Let's see here. Um, uh, now, you, you, oh, the other thing I want to talk about is they're poker-sized cards. Yes. Right. So yeah. you're gonna sleeve them. You know, folks, you can go to Mayday Games or something like that. They do have sleeves that'll fit them. Or whatever. So if you're going to do that, don't don't you know? Just realize they're they're poker sized cards. They're not euro sized or or Ameritrash sized cards, whatever they're calling that. Um, and the yeah. mini cards, the the little gang. Um, the crew cards. Yeah, the crew cards are, are crew mini. cards are, are minis, which are half the size of a poker card. Right. So you know, just remember that, and um, when we you go have to um, we have counters too. So you have your mission counters. And then you have arrest counters, you have uh, um, stills, and then right kidnapped. Um, so you can you can uh, kidnap characters, you can get characters locked up in jail, and then you have stills. So the still counter has one still on one side and two on the other, which you place down on your storefronts. And then the counters for arrest and kidnapped get placed on the payroll characters. So not only can you just outright try and kill other people's characters. You can also put them in jail and you can get them kidnapped and then that ties them up. So if I got a if I got a capo on my payroll and you put him in jail, I can't just write him off. He's sucking up that spot on my payroll. I'm gonna have to go free him. And there's a number of ways that you do that in the game, but um, you know exactly. right. So it, it's gonna take space up in your hand if you need that card to Right. And then you're you're gonna have to address it. Um, so just like you would in real life. So it's pretty cool um, from that standpoint of the different things. And then there, there's the same kind of things you can do to storefronts like that. You can put blockades on storefronts for city politics or if you uh, drop a dime on somebody else's uh, storefront, meaning you've contacted the police department, then their storefront produces it half, uh, half um, of the ability it normally would because now the police are watching them. So you drop the dime on them. It's pretty. I mean, there's a lot of cool things like that, and then all the all the flavor cards. Um, you know, and we've tried to do that through like the action cards with the the and the missions, and they all have names, and and right. uh, we had a lot of fun going through that as designers. And they, you know, like, hey, let's try and get all these cool terms in there. So that was a lot of that was a lot of fun going through. Well, as, uh, you know, I mean, that's the thematicism, but I wanted to address the still counters. The still counters allow you to add one or two hooch to each storefront each round, so people Correct. know what it is, right? So basically, you're getting more more currency. That's the effect of the still. Right, ex exactly. So you just place that down on the storefront, and it ups the production. So and and now that each storefront has a limit. Some storefronts let you have one still, some two, some three, and it's kind of based on the in my mind as a designer the size of what that storefront would be. You right. know, uh, a jewelry shop is very small, a bakery is very big. <laughs> so. Right. All right, so there it is, folks. That is Hooch in a, well, not so much a nutshell, but there it is, right? <laughs> so you, right. 
you get a good idea of what this game is all about and what it includes and, and the quality of the stuff that you're seeing. Um, you know, I, I strongly recommend that you take a look at it on Kickstarter. There's how many days left? 22 days for this? Yeah, 22 days left. And also, too, just realize, and, and now, because of where we are in the campaign, you're actually, for $39 at the, at the base funding for the game, you're actually going to get six syndicates. You're going to get six now. So uh, that value is gargantuan. Um, it has no extra shipping in the U.S. There is a little bit for overseas. Uh, I apologize. The shipping is what it is. I wish I controlled that industry. I don't. Um, but oh my gosh, you're going to get the you get the base game plus the my backer syndicate, and then you're going to get the Lethal Ladies expansion, which is the pink cards, which comes with the syndicate, comes with the crew, comes with custom counters, comes with custom uh, payroll characters, all right. female. Right. So, in closing on my end, folks, I know there's a lot of people out there like, look at how many back projects has been backed by a person who's created a game. Well, like me, Jason has two different accounts on Kickstarter, and so there's, you know, a lot more backing than you might see on one account. So, you know, don't look at that and go, well, he hasn't backed that much. You really have no idea how many he's backed. The other thing is the price of, of 35 grand for this first Kickstarter. This is business. Things cost money, and to put things out at this level, this quality, it costs money. $35,000 is not much money for any kind of project or business thing. I've done Kickstarters way bigger than that for musicians who need a lot more money that have absolutely no acclaim whatsoever. So don't let that pull you. This game is worth the price. Get behind it, back it. Please, RT, please share. Put this on your social media networks. Go talk about it on Board Game Geek. Go talk about it on Reddit. Go talk about it on Google Plus. Wherever it is that you hang out and do most of your stuff, talk about it and share it and take an honest good look at it. There's a lot of money that went into this game ahead of time, way more than I've seen for most other games. So give it a fair shake, and, and, and if, you, if you really like it, if you think it looks cool, share it and talk about it. There's only three weeks left, all right? Yeah. All right. Jason, I want to thank you for coming and talking with us. Uh, you know, sharing your game with us, and again, thank you so much for all the hard work you put into this, sending us this custom built um, game. This was awesome. I'm, I'm enjoying it thoroughly. Uh, everybody around me that's playing it with me is enjoying it thoroughly. Um, we haven't had any real negative comments about it at all. Um, so, I, you know, I definitely am standing behind this game 100%. And again, thanks for taking the time to talk with us, and we wish you all the best on this. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it, David. It's been a pleasure to. Uh, talk with you and work with you uh, as a you know as a reviewer for for this really a, a neat experience for me. Thanks. Thanks. All right, folks. Uh, you can find us at clubfantasy.com. You can find uh, Jason at uh, I think it's talentstrikestudios.com. It's talentstrikes.com. We drop the studio on our website. I'm also on Twitter at uh, my handle is at talentstrikes. All right. Uh, like the Facebook page. Do all the things that you know to do to help support the community. And, uh, you know, if you're watching this video uh, off of our web page itself, all these links will be posted there. So just go to the bottom of the page and you can see it. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of what we have to offer. And I hope what we offer you is something that you enjoy. Have a great day.